Hey, welcome to Complaints on a Plate. Today we're going to be watching a very old episode of The Media Show in which they interview the editor of The Times, John Witherow. It's a great name, John Witherow. <laughs> and his withering comments. Just uh, just checking uh, what's behind me. Make sure all my uh, sex toys and anti-Semitic literature are not in shot. <laughs> It's a classic, classic Zoom blunder. Uh, so, uh, yeah, this is a great show. It's ostensibly supposed to be like a sort of softball interview show. I don't know why it would have to be that way. The editor of The Times is a very, very powerful person, obviously. And so it might be quite good to have a quite a hard-hitting interview with them. But because they're in the media and the BBC is also the media that they have to pretend like that it's a, some sort of like celebrity and they're just asking them harmless questions about their latest film. But having said all that, because John Withrow never really ever gets asked hard hitting questions and never really has to watch what he says, despite the really lame questions, it's actually quite revealing because he just sort of comes out with a pretty pretty ridiculous and, and quite sort of telling things about uh, wh what's wrong basically with uh, British media, uh, essentially. What was it that drove you to become a journalist in the first place? Well, when I was 19, I went to what was then Southwest Africa um, to work as a, as a volunteer teacher and I was meant to go up to the border with Vambaland uh, and Angola. But the authorities then with South Africa, uh, they, they govern Southwest Africa. It's now Namibia. And so I couldn't do that. I couldn't go up and teach there. So I set up a library in Windhoek, the capital. And while I was there, one of the people I was working with got expelled by the South Africans. And he was a stringer for the BBC World Service uh, and BBC Africa Service. So he just handed it to me. I knew nothing about journalism. It's, it's like the classic sort of boomer story. I was just on my way home after a day of drinking and uh, I realized I really needed the toilet and there was no way I was going to get back in time because I was totally and utterly shit-faced. Uh, so I uh, went into the IBM HQ, which uh, was just next door and had no security at the time. It was just a sort of open door that you could just wander into. Uh, I wandered in there and, and I went to the toilet and uh, I relieved myself. I was feeling pretty good and as I walked out, or staggered out, <laughs> still very, very drunk, uh, someone just offered me the position of CEO of IBM. And uh, that's, like, the, <laughs> the question is, what drove you to become, uh, nothing drove him, you just sort of fell into the position. And uh, I started, I had to learn very fast doing Broadcast. I think I was terrible, actually, but they were really nice at the World Service and they encouraged me. Uh, and so I did a series of interviews and told them what was going on in Southwest Africa, which was a really interesting time because, as I say, it was, it was apartheid on steroids. It had a large Afrikaner and German population who were very hard line. Uh, and it was, a, it was a very difficult time. And, and the people I was working with, three of them got expelled. Two of them were put under arrest in South Africa. So we were seen as a kind of hotbed of anti-apartheid. Yeah, apart, South, apartheid South Africa, uh, that, that's why he's now the, the editor of The Times, because he was, you know, he saw firsthand the issue of apartheid. And I'm sure he was very much at the forefront of wanting to end this terrible, <laughs> terrible regime. This was probably at the time, right, when Jeremy Corbyn was getting arrested for protesting it. Uh, because he was going against British uh, foreign policy. Uh, and now this guy is like, yes, I remember apartheid. We fought that and we beat it. Uh, I was there. And now I'm in the editor of The Times. I'm, I'm continuing this fight. And from the beginning of your career, from then, and then later on you focused on foreign reporting. You covered the Iranian embassy siege in your first week, I think. Uh, then the Iran-Iraq and Falklands wars. Is foreign news really where your heart lies? No, it, it, it was then. Um, by the way, I was a terrible war reporter. Uh, Why? But I, I seem to be getting sent to all these wars. Um, what made you a terrible war reporter? Well, I tried, I tried to cover the wars in a really kind of objective way. 
um, particularly the Falklands, and Max Hastings was there. And he understood, no, you had to do it in a way that the British wanted to read about it. And I was still applying old Reuters rules to it, that we had to cover it fairly, and, and, uh, which was nonsense. I thought it was very important at the Times that we had to take a much more constructive attitude towards news. One thing I've seen over the years is that you read the media, and newspapers in particular, and they portray a very negative image of what's going on in the world. Um, so that people, and I think this is one of the reasons there's less trust, because people look at their own lives and see generally things are getting better, and I mean very generally, it's generalization. Things are getting better, but that's not what they see in the media, where everything looks like it's going to hell in a handcart. Um, and I think it's important that the Times starts doing more constructive news. <laughs> the, the, I mean, this is incredible, incredible analysis. The, 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 firstly, that's the reason for mistrust. The reason that people don't trust the media is because the media is making things that out to be really bad, but our lives are great. That's, that's where the mistrust is coming from, right? And then secondly, just that whole idea that I'm reading all this t terrible news about how the Tory party are cutting all the services and ruining the country. But in my day-to-day -day experience, uh, everything's amazing. I, I walk down the boarded up high street to the overcrowded NHS hospital and I think things are just going from strength to strength. If you read the newspapers, you think everything's getting worse. It's not. And, and we in, want to change that direction. And in terms of how far you would push your journalists to bring in stories, I mean, people have told me that you rule by fear that they're afraid of you. Do well, you recognise that? I, I've heard that and I don't believe it. <laughs> afraid of me. Why would anybody be afraid of the editor of The Times? I'm just a nice... Look at my face. Look at this guy. Is it your way of ensuring that people, that your journalists bring in scoops, that you need to put pressure on them? Yeah, I think, I think everybody needs that. I think, you know, scoops, exclusives uh, are central to all publications, that without them, you're just reporting the mass out there. And we have to differentiate ourselves. Yeah, we, we really like scoops, uh, except when there was massive parties going on, the centre of government, at the heart of Westminster politics, right, in Downing Street itself. Then we, we, we had no scoops, couldn't, couldn't, find out, couldn't find out what was going on in Downing Street, where, where all the journalists are all the time. <laughs> what, but we only found out about it uh, through a leak like a year and a half later. Uh, that's how much The Times loves scoops. Is, uh, that, and of course, as we, we all now hear, the editor of The Times has quite a close relationship with Boris Johnson. So how did they not know about this? And is it right that you play tennis with Boris Johnson and other members of the family? Uh, I think I've only played once with Boris, but I played with, with his brother Joe and his sister Rachel. Any good? Yeah, they're good. You? <laughs> Adequate. <laughs> Do you think it might be a problem to play tennis with family members of the Prime Minister? When you, when you are the editor of a newspaper that is there to critique government. There's, a no one else, there's just no one else to play tennis with. Why, why is there just about, you know, 30 people in the whole country that, that run everything and are all friends and live in the same village? Why didn't you break party gate? Uh, would have loved to. It's a good scoop, <laughs> There are lots of one. stories we'd have loved to have broken. I think the, the, the FT Cameron and Greensill was a very good story. Uh, it's interesting, isn't it, party gate very few journalists, there were all these parties going on, very few journalists knew about it. You um, had it in your lap in a sense because on Saturday, June the 20th, 2020, the Times published a story by Stephen Swinford, who is yeah. the deputy political editor, and Oliver Wright, the policy editor, and it said, Boris Johnson celebrated his 56th birthday yesterday with a small gathering in the cabinet room. Rishi Sunak, the chancellor, and a group of aides sang him happy birthday yeah, yeah. before they tucked into a union jack cake. So back then, you had well what spotted. then became a huge story. How could you print it well at the time spotted. without realising well it was incendiary? We missed it. <laughs> what do you think about that now? It's embarrassing. <laughs> <laughs> Had you heard about parties at Downing Street before the Mirror and ITV published their scoops? No, apart from that one you mentioned. <laughs> In that sense, you'd heard of it, but not, not recognised it. I don't as a think we put together that it was clashing with, at that time exactly with the 
instructions the government had done. I think that's what happened. That's why we didn't spot it. None of us did. I hadn't recognised it as a party. Like, Boris Johnson didn't know what a party was. No one knows. It's, it's such, a, such a difficult idea to grasp, isn't it? What is a party? Do you, I, mean, I guess our viewers and audiences will be very interested in you know, how powerful is the Times? If you wanted to, could you bring Boris Johnson down? Well, only, only through a story that was shocking and that people thought was absolutely unacceptable. You couldn't do it any other way. I mean, if we were campaigning that he should go, I don't think that would make any difference, for example. It's, it's the actual stories that change public opinion and the Tory party's views that would bring him down. Couldn't it also be more subtle than that? I mean, if you decided that you thought, for example, if you backed Rishi Sunak tomorrow and you did it subtly, so you just started writing articles that painted him in a positive light, do you think that that would swing it? No. And would you do that? No, not at this stage. But there could be a stage when you might switch allegiance. Yeah, maybe. What would it take? I don't know. We'll have to see. <laughs> <laughs> do you plan to do it anytime soon? Mm, we'll have to see. Interesting. Interesting. So fucking sinister. Do you think, I mean, it's interesting, do you think papers can do that? Can bring people down? Because it used to be the case that you, that was an understanding, that, that, that newspapers could, if they chose to, bring down politicians. I don't think, as I say, stories can. I don't think a paper like The Times can, because we don't campaign overtly. We don't think that's our role against a politician. You might, you might find that a paper like The Mail or The Sun can be much more vehement and vitriolic against a leader than we can. I think our readers like that. I mean, they want us to present the news for them to make up their own minds, not for us to tell them what to think. And can I just ask you, because you have a, a columnist, James Forsyth, whose, do, whose wife, Allegra Stratton, was central in the Partygate story early on. The Times has columnists, as they're talking about now, and columnists don't break stories. They don't really report on... They're not journalists in the same way as if you're going to write an actual article. A columnist gives their opinion. A columnist is trying to persuade you of their view, right? Or is, is offering their view in a sort of public arena, swaying to some degree where the public conversation is, right? So if you've got a lot of columnists for the Times and they're all saying a certain sort of Thing, then, you know, it's ridiculous for him to say that the Times doesn't do that. The Times just reports stories when it, it has columnists like all, all newspapers do. And the stories themselves, of course, what do you publish? What do you investigate? The Times has the luxury of being on the right and therefore it doesn't have to pursue a particular agenda because the agenda of the Daily Mail and the Sun is already dominant. So it can sit back and let those papers break weird investigative stories about obscure things that are happening in the Labour Party or in Jeremy Corbyn's, you know, ancient past. And then they can just, that then becomes the news agenda. And then the Times can just reiterate that oh this is what's happening in the news at the moment and that that's you know saying that the, the, the stories themselves are, are what's going to make it is is this is idea that the, the stories are just sort of naturally uh occurring in the world and the times are just taking them in one by one no the times uh along with the sort of general right-wing press are deciding which stories they're going to go for and they're deciding who they're going to investigate, who they're going to send journalists out to sort of to to doorstep and to go through their litter and to look into their past and, and, and look at old meetings and things they've been to and, and go through their Twitter feed and Facebook and stuff to find these stories. They don't do that to Tory MPs for the most part, right? Just to remind uh, the audience, she was Downing Street press secretary and she resigned after a leaked video showing her being asked about a now infamous cheese and wine uh, event during lockdown. What conversations were you having with him at the time? And was that uncomfortable for you both that he was so personally involved in the story? Yeah, I think it was very upsetting for him because of what happened to her and she was clearly very upset. Um, 
But, but the, the strength of James is not just through Allegra, but through other sources. He has amazing contacts in government, and he can tell readers what he thinks is going on and the general drift of the party and what ministers say. They'll talk to him extensively off the record. And he's very closely linked to Rishi Sunak, the Chancellor. And he's closely linked to Rishi Sunak. Um, so he has a real insight, and I think it's important that papers can give readers a sense of what's happening through somebody who is incredibly well-connected. So one, one of the Times columnists wife was working for Boris Johnson's government as as this the sort of media uh, spokesperson right so you know the ins- it's the incestuous nature of <laughs> the times newspaper the editor playing tennis with Boris Johnson's siblings one of their columnists being married to Boris Johnson's media person and then and then he's like oh well you know the times we we just report which is report stories. If we if we think Boris Johnson's doing a good job, we'll say they are. They say they is. And if we know, we won't. You know, we we're, we're just a, you know. It's like you know, you are part of. You're basically an arm of the Tory party. We've talked on the media show a lot before about the revolving door between the press and politicians. In fact, the Prime Minister's new Director of Communications, Guti Hari, who also worked at the BBC, also worked for a time here between 2012 and 2015 for News UK. Is there something undemocratic or uncomfortably cosy anyway about the relationship between the press and politicians? When a journalist or a Director of Communications comes to work for a newspaper, presumably the newspaper is buying something from them, that expertise? Is it more than that? Is the access to power? Maybe, but it's pretty transient as people move on. Um, it's just if you hire them as a journalist, you're hiring them for their, their skills as a journalist, not necessarily for contacts that could disappear quite soon. And if you're not hiring them as a journalist, that's something different, I suppose. Yeah. And I wonder, even though, you know, in a sense, you're a completely establishment figure, you even play tennis with the prime minister, but perhaps you, like Murdoch, see yourself as a bit of an outsider. Do you yeah, I think, over that? I think journalists should be outsiders. We shouldn't be part of the establishment. But you just said that you want journalists to be inside Downing Street with good connections so that you can get the scoops, right? Uh, we should always be scrutinising it and, and being critical when we think it's right. It's supportive if they do the right things, but generally we're critics. Well, that's the right thing. Generally we're critics, but my criticism is that Actually, everything's going really well, and the news is too critical, if anything. The implication of that sort of opening statement of things are getting better is that that's because of the way the country's run, right? The government's doing a bang-up job. The Times has taken quite a campaigning stance on gender, for example, particularly with Janice Turner's column, but also in general, you know, news coverage. What's your take on that debate? Well, look, it's an, ex- it's an explosive topic, as you know. Uh, and, and Janice's line has always been, well, we are sympathetic, obviously, to, to trans people who are transitioning. I mean, that's just, so we should be. But, but what, is she, what she's done is taken on the militants, the, 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 the people who self-declare themselves, in many cases, as women. And in Janice's view, intrude on, on women's rights, you know, where they appear in their public lavatories, their changing rooms in sports. And this isn't right. And I back her on that. I think it's the right approach. But, but you know, people get very, very angry about it. Because those are quite controversial views for many, for yeah. some. Yeah. I don't know if it's many or some. <laughs> could, be, could be none. I have no, this, uh, maybe everybody is on one side of this argument. We, we have no idea. <laughs> because we're just not interested. And that's the thing. It's not, you know, it's not about really being, you know, reporting on where people are. It's about pushing your agenda. And it doesn't matter if, if, if you're popular or not. You make, you frame whatever your position is as the popular position. And you say things like, you know, anybody with any common sense, any good British person would think this, right? And maybe some do, maybe many do, but... That doesn't matter to you at all, because you're not reporting. That's the thing. It's not. It's not about reporting. I was, I was talking to a young man in his twenties who doesn't believe in a lot of these culture wars, and I said, "Well, why don't you go out there and say these things?" He says, "I can't. 
I can't, I'd be cancelled. It's, it's so intolerant. And that's one of the problems I think we face now, that, that we would, as a newspaper, as a title, we would encourage tolerance on all grounds. And yet this has become an extremely vitriolic debate, uh, which is very unwelcome, I think. And you, you mentioned being cancelled. We do apologize for interrupting that program. The whole show itself was cancelled. <laughs> that's, that's how it ended. <laughs> uh, yeah. What you get, I think, from someone like John Witherow being on the media show, is you, is you see someone who is very, very powerful individual, should be held account much more accountable for what they do, for the views they hold, for the way that they conduct uh, being an editor, the way that the Times is run. Um, and you realize, you know, you don't see these people on TV very often. You don't see them being questioned. And even though those questions were basically quite softball, and even the more difficult ones were sort of presented, the, the, there wasn't a feeling that they were trying to, you know, there wasn't that atmosphere of sort of hostility that you might get uh, against a politician, for example, which immediately makes them look suspect because the journalist is, is is so sort of argumentative and aggressive towards them. It wasn't any of that. Because basically the idea is that there's no way that this person who's the editor of a newspaper in the UK, there's no way that they could be part of the problem, right? Part of the reason why this country is in such a mess. Because the institutions, the media, they're supposed to function really well. We have, we're, you know, the, 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 the sort of framing is always that, well, we live in a really well-developed democracy that's working very, very well. It couldn't possibly be the case that the editor of The Times is a complete idiot who's completely out of touch, coming across as someone that really doesn't know the first thing about what most people's experience of life is these days in the UK. You know, even as he's saying that, because of the way that the conversation is framed, it doesn't sound like it's so bad. You know, like his idea is, well, the problem with the Times is that the stories are too negative. And it's like, you're friends with the government. <laughs> and you still think, you know, you support basically the government of this country, you think things are getting better. Uh, <laughs> Uh, the government are doing a good job, but but, but that's still too critical. We need to make it even nicer than that. 